OK, so we'll, we'll start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event under the 28 for 28 webinar series on the road to COP28. My name is Raydan Sagaf. I am the economist at the United Nations office in the UAE. In today's webinar, we delve into the critical relationship between water, which covers 71% of our planet and climate change. Intensifying cycles of floods and droughts, rising tides, warming oceans, and increasing competition over scarce water resources are key issues that affect all populations around the world. And therefore, this requires a closer look at some of the linkages between water resources and climate change. The UN Water Conference held earlier this year set a milestone by introducing the Water Action Agenda, aimed at accelerating efforts to achieve SDG 6 on water and SDG 14 on life below water. This is an area of work that, is, that has been further embraced by the upcoming COP28 presidency. We are privileged to have leading experts who will, lead in, who will share insights on various elements of the water climate nexus. I invite you to share and post your questions at the chat to be discussed at the Q&A segment towards the end of the webinar and through submitting the questions on the chat. Now, I'd like to give the floor for our colleague Nicolas Franke, the coordinator and program officer at WMO, to deliver the lead presentation on behalf of the UN Water Expert Group. Nicola, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Raidan, and uh, good uh, afternoon uh, to you all. Uh, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to present here today uh, on the nexus between water and climate. I'm joined uh, with my colleague from the UN Water Expert Group on Water and Climate Change, Anil Mishra uh, from uh, UNESCO, and hopefully uh, I'm our colleague Sonia Koppel from the UN Commission for Europe will also join us uh, soon. Ah, there she is. Hi, uh, Sonia. Good, good, good to see you. Thanks for 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 making it happen. So, uh, just as a quick uh, introduction, the the expert group uh, on water and, and climate change of um, of the United Nations is basically an interagency coordination mechanism. We have over thirty UN entities working on water. Uh, issues and through UN Water, we coordinate our work, provide policy advice, uh, raise awareness, and uh, uh, provide capacity uh, development uh, to different uh, stakeholders. So, in this case, uh, WMO, UNEC, and UNESCO are the um, are the uh, coordinators of uh, the expert group on water and climate change. I will. Uh, Start now sharing my my screen. One second, please. To start the presentation. Uh, there we go. I hope you will be able to to see it. So yes, thank you very much again for 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 joining uh, this presentation today on the vital nexus of water and climate. This is really a topic that is very close uh, to my heart as we are experiencing always more the impacts of water uh, through uh, climate uh, change. And water is, of course, a fundamental resource in our day to day lives. I would like to start by by giving you a quick overview of the nexus uh, between our hydrological cycle and climate change. And as you can see in this uh, figure, water evaporates uh, from the ocean or from the land surface uh, is then transported as moisture uh, through our atmosphere and uh, falls down in form of precipitation or snow on our uh, on our our land is then either stored uh, as as uh, as ice in our in our um, in our um, uh, mountains or flows down our rivers to then replenish our wetlands, our lakes, our reservoirs, trickles down our, uh, into our uh, groundwater system, is then of course used by different stakeholders uh, for industry, agriculture, for domestic use, for our uh, drinking water as a drinking water source, before it then ends up again in the ocean or evaporates again into the atmosphere. And this hydrological cycle now is really rapidly changing due to various factors. 
And uh, one of the most significant uh, factors is climate change. And the rising global temperatures that uh, we are experiencing are altering the precipitation uh, patterns, leading to changes in the distribution and the intensity of rainfall or snowfall. And this can then, of course, result uh, in more intense and prolonged droughts uh, in some regions and increased rainfall and flooding in other regions. And this has also been uh, uh, shown in uh, the latest IPCC uh, assessment. And I know that in previous webinar series, uh, you have uh, been introduced to the work of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change. And they show here in this figure how with each degree of global warming, the annual mean precipitation uh, changes. And you can see in this map, that uh, with every degree, the, uh, the, the mean precipitation increases in some parts of the world and it decreases in other parts of the world, making some parts of the world wetter and more flooded and the other regions of the world drier. This is why the World Meteorological Organization has started uh, to assess uh, last uh, year the global state of the water resources. And two weeks ago, we released the second uh, report where we gathered the knowledge of uh, scientists and the meteorological hydrological services from around the world and satellite data. We model uh, uh, the data where it's not available to assess, OK, how was the water last year different to, uh, to, 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 to previous years? And you can see in this latest map from 2022, the regions where water has been much below or below the, the average or was above or much above uh, the, the average normal uh, condition. So this gives us a sense on how our water resources are changing because uh, of, of climate change, but of course also other factors as how water is being managed and distributed. And our ultimate aim is to have uh, up-to-date uh, data, in situ data, means data that every country is monitoring uh, on a real-time basis to know how much water we have actually now available and how will that change in the upcoming months and years uh, to come. And we have been also, of course, seeing, and as men I mentioned uh, at the beginning, we are seeing uh, these hydrological impacts around uh, the entire globe. And we've started to monitor all these uh, high level impacts and also publishing these high level impacts in reports to make policy uh, make, uh, makers aware of the impacts that climate change is having on our uh, hydrological cycle through either floods or droughts. And this is a, a, a short snapshot of the major events that happened in 2022. So what can we do now to adapt and mitigate to these impacts? And I would like to now give the floor to my colleague Anil Mishra to uh, explain you a little bit on that. Anil, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay, let me open my camera. Um, well, uh, first of all, my name is Anil Mistra. I'm one, one of the co-coordinator of UN Water Expert Group, Water and Climate. And uh, I represent uh, UNESCO's Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, uh, only intergovernmental program on uh, science of hydrology. So let's continue with this presentation. As Nicola suggested, what can we do in terms of adaptation, but water role is vital. As he highlighted, water is the victim of climate change and water plays an important role in climate action, be it mitigation to reduce emission. We will come back to you on that. Uh, uh, precisely, Nicola will come back to you on that and adapt to changing climate, uh, how we can offer adaptation measure uh, to to reduce the mitigate uh, the impact of climate change. And when when there is a need to do migration, when uh, despite mitigation and adaptation doesn't work, also we need to consider what role in migration move to safer places. Nicola, can you go to next slide? Yeah. <clears throat> As highlighted in IPCC report, the CO2 concentration is very high in 2 million years. So obviously, uh, mitigation measure needs to be taken and water needs to be considered. We will again highlight the importance of water in mitigation. 
when the sea level rises, particularly we are witnessing in small island uh, developing states or small islands, uh, um, of course, people has to move from different places. And when glaciers are retreating, of course, there is a short benefit of using the water, but also uh, highland people population might need to move into safer places. So we need to look at mitigation, migration, adaptation, both and the, in the context of water. Can you go to next slide? Um, it has been uh, said that when what when the global warming overshoots 1.5 degree, and this is the course that we are heading to, unless we do a drastic measure, most of the uh, adaptation measure becomes less effective. We need to do uh, uh, more and more other measures. This is has been highlighted. So we really need to understand that we we can adapt when we can, but we have to consider other uh, perspective also. Can you go to next slide? And what are those adaptation measures? Uh, those adaptation measures, depending on how you take climate informed decision. What are those mechanisms? How you can take climate informed decision making? One of the methodologies that we've been working from UNESCO with too many uh, many other institutions is climate risk informed decision analysis that allows you to, for instance, you may need to uh, introduce uh, low water intensity crops. You may need to address uh, water energy uh, nexus. You may need to also look at different infrastructure need uh, to protect city from storm flooding mechanism. You may need to uh, introduce uh, water utility based on your climate risk analysis. So this methodology is available in the open science platform within UNESCO in uh, different languages, English, French, Arabic, um, Spanish. So anybody can join, take the course and undertake the, uh, the application needed at the level, at the local level. And I want to just highlight a couple of examples that has been used, but also UNFCCC has uh, taken this course uh, for a climate uh, adaptation academy training courses. So it also provides member states to strengthen themselves uh, to have this tool. So some of the examples, for instance, in, in Thailand, the methodology has been applied to use urban water setting. In California, it, it addressed the drought issues. In South Africa, the, the water allocations and water utilities. So there are different scenarios and providing different plausible uh, scenarios that can be used after using this uh, climate risk informed decision analysis. And with that, I will now pass on to our colleagues who will highlight on transboundary issues if Sonia is available. Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Yes. Okay. OK. So <clears throat> I'll be very brief because I'm actually currently in, in Africa and Botswana for a mission. Um, as I just wanted to highlight one issue, I'm Sonia Köppel. I'm one of the co-coordinators of the expert group, but I'm also the secretary of the Water Convention, which is a crucial legal and intergovernmental framework and platform for transboundary water cooperation. And um, actually, also UAE <laughs> shares some aquifers with uh, neighboring countries, but globally, 153 countries worldwide share um, waters with neighboring countries. So <clears throat> it is actually crucial to cooperate uh, on those waters for peace and development, uh, climate action, and also on climate change adaptation. <clears throat> Cooperating across borders uh, is important uh, in order to reduce uncertainties, in order to share. Uh, the um, information on water status, water availability <laughs> across borders. Uh, Transponding cooperation also helps to address flood and drought more efficiently and effectively. <laughs> it helps to enlarge the planning space and to identify better priorities, because in some cases it can be that an adaptation measure is better to be taken in an upstream country, um, such as uh, flood risk reduction infrastructure, <laughs> etc. We have also seen many examples where uh, Transponding cooperation adaptation can support adaptation planning at the country level, and um, it can lead 
enable sharing costs of and, benef of and benefits. And you can see on the map here how many transponding basins exist. <laughs> so there's really huge potential for this. Um, and this issue has come up now in the discussion on the global golden adaptation, for example, under uh, under UNFCCC. Um, but also one of the COP28 presidency events will be focused on sharing water for peace uh, and security. On the next slide, you can see uh, some of the uh, possible steps in, in transboundary climate change adaptation. And I would like to stress that it's not only about transponding, but also about regional cooperation adaptation. So basically, the different steps in developing an adaptation strategy can or sh should be ideally be done together. Um, on the one hand, assessing climate impacts, then developing a vulnerability assessment, developing basin-wide adaptation strategies and plans, um, um, implement uh, priority adaptation measures, um, um, and um, also integration into um, basin and flood risk management plans. And there are a number of good examples worldwide where such things have already been happening, such as in Tutalas in Central Asia or the Danube or the Mekong Basin in Asia or um, the um, uh, Niger or Volta in, in Africa. Um, and these issues are also included in the um, policy brief of the UN Water Expert Group on Climate Change and Water, uh, which has been published a few years ago. And with this, I hand back to Nicolas for the next part on water for mitigation. Yes, thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you very much, Anil. So I think we provided you until now a little bit of an overview of how uh, climate change is having an influence on our water resources and the hydrological cycle, how we're experiencing more floods and droughts, uh, the precipitation patterns are changing, and you'll presented you uh, of different uh, adaptation strategies and tools that are available. Sonia now focusing on the transboundary uh, issues and the importance of having uh, transboundary cooperation to have an integrated response uh, to the impacts of climate change on our water resources. And one, um, uh, for, uh, when it comes to climate change, uh, we are working, of course, in, uh, on adaptation measures as well as mitigation uh, measures. And these things, uh, these two issues have to go hand in hand. We are, we, we are trying to. Uh, decelerate the climate change through our mitigation measures, but we have to adapt at the same time as we are experiencing it uh, at uh, the, the impacts uh, at the moment. And the part of miti mitigation and uh, seeing water as an important part of the solution uh, to climate uh, change mitigation. This is a, a point that is, uh, we see it as a really a, a blind spot within uh, the climate change uh, discussions. I think the, the the direct impact of uh, of water on a climate res uh, on our water resources through through floods and droughts we feel it every day, but uh, actually water can also be an important uh, so uh, part of the solution for climate change mitigation, and this is why we recently this year in uh, in uh, May at the Bonn uh, Climate Change Conference we organized a workshop to look a little bit uh, more in depth into this issue. And we did some literature research and looked at that actually the IPCC assessments have identified freshwater requirements associated with most measures to reduce emission and sequestration. And we have, I, I, I put here, an, an, a, well, rather older from uh, 2016 uh, uh, pie chart on the distribution of different uh, um, mitigation uh, measures. Uh, but the relations are, are more or less uh, the same uh, at the moment. Of course, just the CO2 emissions have, have uh, risen. And you see that all of these uh, measures actually, uh, as identified by the IPCC, have a link uh, to water. So it's important to consider water when we uh, define our mitigation uh, measures. And then, of course, we have to also uh, balance out how much water is actually necessary for mitigation measures, but also for other uh, important uses as agriculture or uh, drinking water. So we looked at the different uh, energy systems, uh, for example, the potential that they have uh, to reduce CO2 emissions and the water that is necessary for for these measures. And you can see that there here uh, in, in this chart that there is a, a wide range of water volumes that are, uh, are are needed depending on how it's handled and where it's uh, where it's uh, uh, managed. 
We also looked into the sequestration uh, measures of, of, of different um, agriculture, forestry, and other land uh, uses. And this is also a very interesting uh, point because actually 23% of the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from these systems, and they highly also depend on water. So if uh, these systems don't have sufficient water, they don't fun function well as uh, carbon sinks and actually can even start emitting uh, uh, green, greenhouse gases. And then of course, our water systems, uh, directly how we, we manage our water systems, right? How we uh, manage our uh, agriculture systems through irrigation, Water treatment, waste water is actually estimated to cause up to 3% of the total uh, global greenhouse gas uh, emissions and 12% of global methane uh, emissions. And we have to also look into uh, these, these systems to see, okay, how much uh, are we emitting through these systems at the, at the global level, at the national level, and what can we, uh, what can we do about it? So we really see that currently uh, at, the, at, the, at the climate negotiations, but also in the national uh, determined contributions, water is generally not treated as a distinct uh, subject. It is here and there, uh, it, it appears, but actually a very, there are very few NDCs that have uh, measurable targets for either mitigation or adaptation. And actually only 60% of the NDCs link uh, energy and water. And as we I have shown uh, before, and also uh, uh, um, yeah, proven by the IPCC, uh, that there is a strong link between water and the different energy systems. So why are actually uh, countries not taking into consideration water in their uh, uh, miti mitigation measures? And we think that it has not been prioritized because there is actually a lack of information on how much water is actually needed at the national scale, at the global scale, to implement each measure at the scale required to achieve the Paris uh, uh, Agreement targets. And this information and the information also now available to climate policymakers uh, does not show how much actually their emission reduction targets depend on water. So they have. A, a blind spot there, a lack of information there, that they are, and that's why they are actually not dealing with it uh, in the uh, current uh, climate negotiations and in the different UNFCCC uh, work stream. So we are really trying to raise the awareness about uh, this this issue and really uh, demonstrate that water is a necessary part of the climate solution that uh, without considering fresh water in mitigation and adaptation measures, it will be extremely difficult to achieve the Paris Agreement. And that we cannot assume that there is sufficient water uh, for our mitigation measures. As, uh, as explained before, we are, ha are having uh, extremely, an extremely uh, high impact on a high hydrological cycle. Regions are becoming uh, drier. We are, uh, we have, less aware on how much precipitation there will come, and this link uh, needs to be acknowledged. So we have to fill those uh, knowledge gaps, and we have to uh, discuss this more in, our, in the COP negotiations. So just real quick uh, to, to conclude, uh, I understand that in the audience today, we have uh, different stakeholders from, from government, from the UN system, uh, from uh, civil society organization, private sector, and uh, if our message to you, what, what you could do is really raise awareness about the importance of the topic. Uh, we need to hear more about the topic in, uh, in, the, gov uh, in the intergovernmental processes, in, our, in the country's national uh, development plans, national determined contributions. The UN system, of course, there can also play a, a strong role in supporting governments in developing those. And we really need to fill those knowledge gaps. We have to further develop the monitoring systems to actually understand how much water resources do we have now? How will that develop in the future? And we have to assess this dependency of our emission reduction targets and the potential trade-offs that they might have with other sectors such as agriculture and domestic water use. So I'll, I'll stop here and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have uh, later on. Thank you very much and back to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for your rich remarks and presentation, and also thanks to Anil and Sonia for your their, for their uh, contributions as well. These are very valuable insights. It's uh, um, interesting to see how a central issue can be so invisible in the climate negotiations and NDCs, but I do hope through this engagement and subsequent work, we'll be able to give it the prominence it deserves. I also appreciate the cooperation among UN entities UN Economic Commission for Europe, UNESCO, as well as WMO in working together on this role. I think that's a fantastic asset which we applaud you for. Now I would like to turn to Alice Roberti from Unicri, who will offer a unique perspective on this pressing matter. Alice, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting Unicri at such an important event. And thank you also to the speakers. The presentation was uh, um, absolutely informative. Um, I also look forward to hearing about um, the following uh, contributions. Um, I'm sharing now my screen. Can you see it? Um, we can see it. You can maximize it and, and start yeah. from the first slide, perhaps. Perfect. OK. Uh, so today I will talk a little bit about this uh, research report that Hunikri has uh, published a few months back uh, about climate change and violent extremism. Uh, but before that, uh, for those who are not familiar with our work, UNICRI um, is uh, the United Nations Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute. Um, it's one of the six uh, UN Autonomous Research and uh, uh, Training Institute. It was established in 1968 and um, we have a broad mandate to conduct research and implement projects on criminal justice, crime prevention, rule of law, emerging threats uh, um, or security. So in line with uh, these strategic priorities, uh, since uh, 2015, we've been working to prevent violent extremism or to PV uh, in the cell, uh, which together with the Lake Chad Basin is often described as a key case study to understand the complex relationship between um, climate change and violent extremism. Um, this link between climate change and violent extremism is not a direct one. Um, climate change is often described as a risk multiplier, uh, can, which can exacerbate existing conflict. Uh, so to better understand uh, this dynamic, Unicri has started this research effort, effort last year to explore the community's perceptions of uh, um, the impacts of climate change on three interactive areas, uh, productive activities, social cohesion and violent extremism recruitment in uh, three, <clears throat> four target areas of uh, Chad. And to do this, we conducted more than 100 uh, in-depth interviews and we talked with uh, members of local communities as well as um, local and um, traditional authorities. Um, just to <clears throat> give a brief overview, um, here you can see the map of Chad and those uh, four red dots on the left are the targets, target areas we focused on. Um, there is a growing consensus as this region has experienced more and more uh, extreme climate event and um, environmental degradation is also exemplified by the falling water levels of uh, Lake Chad, uh, whose surface area has approximately um, fallen from a shrunk from uh, 20,000 to 2,000 square kilometers in the past 50 years. Um, these um, these effects have been confirmed by our the interviewees and the members of local communities we talked to. Um, for example, they reported um, variable rainfall, variable temperatures, uh, floods, uh, but also longest longer dry seasons as well as drought and desertification. All of this, of course, has a clear link with productive activities. Uh, farmers have reported a decrease in arable land, uh, while nomadic or semi-nomadic pastoralists have um, mentioned that they need now to migrate farther in order to um, graze herds. And fishers also mentioned uh, desertification, which forces them to um, to venture in much less secure areas in order to find fish. Uh, 
these are just a couple of quotes from uh, from our interviews. Um, what we are experience he experiencing here is worrying. I cannot even imagine the price of cereals in the weeks to come. There are barely any herders in the surrounding area due to lack of grazing and and water. Uh, and this situation has uh, had a clear impact also on the social cohesion of these communities. All of the groups we talked to, uh, farmers, herders, fishers, confirmed an increase, um, increased conflicts between and within communities. For instance, um, a traditional authority from Mandul mentioned that just a week before the, the interview took place, there were four dead and three wounded in a clash that was sparked when herds um, went to venture farther in search for pasture, pasture and by doing so man damaged the, the crops of farmers. So it's clear that um, that these clashes that were also reported between um, fishers and herders uh, uh, over competition for water um, it are, are caused by um, these different groups that are trying to um, find a way to adapt to these, uh, to these changes. Um, this has had an impact as well. This uh, increased economic pressure uh, has a, had an impact on the dynamics of uh, violent extremist recruitment. Boko Haram in the region has long used poverty uh, as a way to recruit members. And interviewees mentioned that most recently uh, the, the group has used the economic instability of uh, fishing or farming as um, a way to um, to entice new members, and it was um, it was drawn into the narrative of the recruitment. Uh, for for instance, in one case, the link was made very explicit. Uh, what is the profitability of fishing per day? What is certain? It is very weak. With us, it is with American dollar that you would be paid. So it's in this context that the indirect link between climate change and violent extremism becomes a little bit more clear. Uh, so to conclude, um, this report showed that climate insecurity has an impact on the livelihoods of local communities, and this um, would create tension, which can then be instrumentalized by violent extremist groups, um, creating a vicious cycle of destabilization. So addressing these issues is uh, um, not straightforward, uh, but of course it's vital to deconstruct the narrative of uh, violent extremist groups and also support adaptation mechanisms, as uh, as was mentioned, by um, that, that are brought forward by local communities. I didn't talk about them now, but they are included in the report. Um, so. In this context, Sunikri is continuing to work uh, on this topic. Um, we recently launched a research on the link between food insecurity and violent extremism in East Africa. And we were also partnered with the, the United Nations Office of West Africa and the CEL, UNOWAS, to uh, continue working on climate security. So um, I will uh, um, conclude here my presentation, but if you're interested, feel free to get in touch and we'll be happy to share any resources with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, Alice, for your uh, rich presentation. I think it, it goes far to say that uh, the climate peace and security link is becoming more pronounced and is becoming more visible on the agenda of climate negotiations. COP28 is the first COP to have a dedicated thematic day to discuss the issue of peace and how it links to the key issues that the populations face around the world. Was it in the Lake Chad region, which is one example, but that same situation is happening elsewhere in the world, in Darfur, in our region and other parts of the world. So on that note, perhaps I can turn to our colleague Ziad Khayyat from ESQA to share with us his uh, uh, intervention on the shared water resources. Ziad, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this. Let me start sharing um, my presentation. OK, uh, can you see it? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Ziad. Perfect. All right. So I just wanted to give an overview of the work that we've done on climate change in the Arab region 
and uh, how that's uh, uh, informing uh, policy making and work on this. In in back in about I guess ten years, twenty twelve, uh, ESQA and uh, regional partners uh, through the League of Arab States and many of the UN organizations at the regional level, uh, we are leading a an initiative which is a regional initiative for the assessment of climate change impacts on water resources and socioeconomic vulnerability in the Arab region. Uh, its acronym is RICAR, and basically it aims to provide. Uh, the, the, as as uh, Nicholas um, mentioned, it aims to provide the evidence base to inform policies and to inform uh, on uh, the impacts of climate change on water resources and water related uh, sectors. Uh, so uh, we've done projections for the what we what was the Arab domain where we have the entire Arab region within one domain uh, and uh, Two scenarios, the moderate climate change scenario and the business as usual scenarios were done for the uh, Arab region uh, till the end of the century. And all of this data is available on the RICAR website, which is the RICAR.org, uh, which showed as expected an increase of temperature up to five degrees by the end of century in the business as usual uh, climate scenario. In terms of uh, precipitations, uh, the projections were more variable across the region. But in the business as usual scenario, uh, it was clear that uh, some regions and most of the region will have a decline in precipitation and regions uh, along, for example, like the uh, northern uh, Atlas Mountains will have a significant decline or regions in the upper Euphrates Tigris Basin will also have a decline in precipitation. Uh, so this was used uh, to inform uh, regional uh, policy making, regional decision and uh, and dialogue along climate change in the region. And then since then, about two years ago, we've moved to into a finer scale. The Arab domain was at 50 kilometer uh, square scale. Now we've moved to a 10 kilometer scale to inform more on the national at the basin level uh, action that's needed on climate change. And what we've now defined called the metric uh, uh, domain. And this has projections uh, uh, up to the year 2060. Uh, so what we're calling near term from 21 to 2040 and 2041 to 2060. And what we've seen from this that by the midterm, uh, the uh, Mashrik domain uh, will see an increase in temperature of uh, as much as 2.7 degrees uh, with a mean increase of 1.8 degrees, again, higher than the uh, global mean of 1.7 degrees. Uh, also, uh, precipitation in this Maastricht domain is not uh, will not exhibit a, a lot of change, but what we've seen is a lot of increased interannual and seasonable uh, uh, variability expected. So what we're expecting is more dry spells and uh, more um, uh, more uh, flooding. And I'll, I'll go through uh, some example at the transboundary level, and you'll see exactly uh, so what's projected by midterm from the uh, Maastricht domain. Uh, why transboundary? Because transboundary, two thirds of the water resources in the Arab region are transboundary water resources. So in, in the Arab region, 21 out of 22 countries share either a transboundary river, lake or aquifer. So we've looked at climate change and how that impacts uh, the climate change. And Sonia mentioned that when we're looking at climate change, it's always important to widen the scope of our study and uh, adaptation is much better on it on a basin level, a transboundary basin level than each country doing uh, their adaptation plans within one basin. And I'll show a clear example of what I mean. So if you look at the Tigris Euphrates basins uh, shared between Iraq, uh, Syria, Turkey, uh, Iran. So uh, projections have shown that again by mid uh, midterm we will see an increase of up to 2.2 degrees on average and uh, and that as actually in some areas up to 2.7 degrees. In terms of pre precipitation again the variability is clear. Uh, what we've seen actually in Iraq an increase of 13% in precipitation. So now if I'm in Iraq and I'm looking at this and I say, OK, great, so there's an increase in precipitation. Uh, but if you look at the entire basin, you see that in the upper basin where most of the source of the water of these shared rivers, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates, there's actually a decrease in precipitation of 8%. So that's again feeds back into widening the scope of, of climate change adaptation and looking beyond the uh, national and looking at the entire uh, basin, which is very important in this region 
and as many as I said of the waters are shared. Uh, I've talked about drought and we see that uh, by uh, midterm by 2060, there's a projected 11% increase in drought frequency uh, in this basin. So basically what we see is that although precipitation has variability, evaporation is uh, projected to increase due to increasing temperature. Runoff is uh, expected to uh, decrease having less water in the Tigris Euphrates basins as the snow in the upper basin is affected. So again, this is uh, projecting in a region where there's a lot of transboundary uh, basins that uh, it's important to look at climate change and climate change adaptation at the transboundary uh, level. Just touching base on a little bit what Alice said in terms of uh, water and conflict and climate change, we've seen uh, that climate change uh, vulnerability and hazard and exposure within the fragility, which is uh, which is uh, widespread in the region in many countries, that uh, this could lead to a more and more uh, of a resource competition. Uh, as this is a water scarce country, uh, climate change is introducing more variability and affecting the available water resources. So we see that the competition for water coupled with poor water resources management is one transmission channel by which climate change can translate into conflict. Uh, for example, we've seen in Sudan uh, incidents of violence uh, between petrolists and farmers over uh, use of uh, increasing ownership and use of increasing scarce water resources. And of course, I don't need to address, uh, which is very well known, conflict and how that can affect the water resources. Uh, very clear examples in Syria and what we are seeing uh, today in, in Gaza. So I'll stop there and maybe uh, allow more room for uh, questions. But again, to stress that uh, all of this data and all of this uh, regional information on climate change projections data is freely available and we're happy to provide to any that's, uh, that are interested. Uh, again, you can visit the regard.org website and access all of this wealth of information. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, let me try to stop sharing. Thank you very much, Ziad, for your rich presentation and the reflection on the important work that Ricard does in terms of providing an evidence base for policy making, but also the uh, expanding our knowledge of the key issues that we face in terms of water resources, increasing salinity, change in weather patterns, rainfall and other related matters. Thank you. I'd like now to turn to our colleague uh, Tatiana from uh, Gumbuk. Gumbuk is a civil society organization uh, based in the UAE, working on a different perspective of this of relevance about greening urban landscapes and how we tackle climate change in the context of uh, limited water resources in the UAE. Tatiana, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Raidan, and thank you all for this opportunity. Allow me to um, share the screen very quickly. Tell me if you can see it. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yes. So thank you for, for the opportunity. As I was saying, my name is Tatiana. I'm the founder of Gumbuk. Gumbuk is a social enterprise that um, uh, was started back in 2009 in the UAE, in Dubai. The aim of Gumbuk is to raise awareness. And, and uh, in the previous uh, presentation, I, I heard a couple of times this urgent need to raise awareness at different levels um, of the community about um, different challenges we face, but water is definitely uh, a top priority. Uh, in the UAE, back in 2009, it was a topic that was uh, not really at uh, the forefront. And a way that we've been using to uh, tackle it was to actually take people, companies, government bodies into the desert here in the UAE to talk about the local ecosystem compared to the way we're greening cities nowadays. Um, if you look at the way we're greening our cities, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and, and other cities in the region, uh, unfortunately, this is the kind of scenario that we see the most beautiful lush palm trees. Uh, from a cultural point of view, of course, um, they are one of the favorite trees uh, that uh, in, are planted. We have also, also other species 
imported from other countries um, that consume a lot of water. In the case of palm trees, uh, we're talking about up to 300 liters a day per palm tree as a requirement uh, in, in irrigation uh, while we actually live in, in the desert. So as part of our awareness, we've been really uh, raising uh, the topic of indigenous species, specifically the gap tree, which is a UAE national tree. The gap tree is the symbol of, of, of resilience and, and survival in the desert. It's adapted to a very harsh climate, very arid, grows in the dunes. Uh, we raise awareness about all the ecosystem around it. Uh, some species unique to the UAE and to this tree, such as this uh, longhorn beetle that is uh, the second biggest beetle in the world and, and lives in the gaff roots. But most of the ecosystem in the desert depends on these indigenous trees uh, for shelter, for food. Um, and and um, this is something that unfortunately as part of the global uh, awareness is not uh, present. Not many know that the humans as well have been able to live and survive in the desert thanks to these trees. First reason is because they were a symbol of maybe having some water under the ground. Until today, in some of the protected areas here in the UAE, uh, near the Gap Tree uh, Forest, there are some of the most ancient wells where the Bedouins were able to get water from the underground um, table. The tree was also very, very uh, important in terms of uh, medicinals. People were able to cure asthma, bronchitis, but also skin diseases such as leucoderma. Um, of course, source of food for humans too. Pods were cooked and are still cooked uh, the same way we eat green beans in other parts of the world. So by raising awareness about indigenous uh, trees and, and the fact that they don't need much water, we, we feel it's really important. We also explain that these trees have specific systems to survive. The gap tree is a taproot tree, uh, goes down sometimes 40 meters to get uh, water. If the tree doesn't find any water, and unfortunately this is happening more and more, it survives thanks to the trunk, which absorbs the humidity from the air um, at night, and in the morning it closes hermetically to avoid evaporation. And also the million uh, leaves are able to, one, absorb the morning dew, but also condense the humidity and provoke a sort of rain in the desert to self-water uh, its roots, but also to provide water to all the other different species. The threats are, of course, um, um, non-indigenous species, such as the mesquite tree, which is killing many gaff trees and other indigenous trees here in the, in the region. Uh, the water table going down uh, and gaff trees not being able to access uh, water anymore. And of course, logging and urban um, development uh, needing to destroy most of the natural groves that we face. So we are planting more gaff trees in the UAE. Uh, we are using and we're trying to work with innovations um, and, and research teams. In this case, this is a project in partnership with IGBA in Dubai, the International Center for Saline Agriculture. We are irrigating our gaff trees with saline water uh, to see how tolerant they are, and the experiments are being very, very positive. The trees grow slower, but uh, they continue growing and uh, they don't need fresh water. We also tried some uh, new innovations, such as this breathable sand that can be um, uh, installed uh, under trees, under shrubs, and under plantations, also for not only uh, leaf trees, but also farm trees. Uh, the water basically uh, reduction is by 80%. This sand is able to keep the water at root level without having the water trickling down and being lost. Um, we've been working with also nano clay, liquid nano clay, as another way to reduce the water need in uh, specifically in, uh, in agriculture. And we've tested also the Groesis box. <clears throat> It's been tested widely in the region in agriculture, uh, but also in, in uh, landscaping, and it reduces as well by 70% the usage of, uh, of irrigation. This is the same box two years later with a very healthy gaff uh, ga tree, and this is only 20 liters of water per month uh, being used. 
This is a, um, a plantation we did in the desert of Sharjah back in 2016. So as you can see, bare land. This is three years later, the gap trees have grown and have or are already producing their own pods that we harvest for seeds. And this is in 2021, a very mature gap forest, completely independent. We removed the irrigation from it after two years, and now it's uh, hosting a very rich ecosystem and, and wildlife um, is benefiting tremendously. This is the kind of awareness that, that we do and, and programs that we've been running. Uh, but at the same time, what we realized um, we've, by creating a tree planting program, um, we've started receiving a lot of requests by government and also by private sector to plant millions of these indigenous trees. And this is where we decided not to uh, move forward because yes, planting a few of these trees has benefits. Uh, planting millions of them could have actually negative environmental impact. Even using all the technologies and innovations, still there's uh, too much water needed. We also talk a lot about the fact that water here is desalinized water, the impact that it has in terms of carbon emissions, the link with climate change, and also the brine being uh, going back into the ocean and the, the terrible impact it has on marine life and marine Ecosystem. So for this reason, we've moved our tree planting programs and dedicated our efforts to plant mangroves. We've done a partnership with the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment of the UAE. We are the partners of the National Sequestration Program by planting ga um, mangroves in Abu Dhabi and Ajman, two different emirates. Uh, hopefully soon uh, we will be able to plant also in other emirates such as uh, Ras al Khaimah and, and Sharjah. Um, we raise awareness again about the fact that these trees don't need irrigation, play a very important role in terms of coastal protection and uh, marine habitat. And at the same time, we link it to climate change and climate action by showing how these trees, um, the powerful uh, um, sequestration um, uh, cap capabilities they have compared to desert trees. A study showed that a gaff tree can sequester only 36 kilograms of CO2 being a desert tree and growing very slowly compared to mangroves that have a capacity 10 times that of a desert tree and five times uh, of a regular tree. So now our efforts are dedicated to uh, promote these kind of plantations in the UAE and also abroad, but also to connect back to the usage of water and the importance of preserving water resources. We're also launching a project in the whole MENA region uh, called the Regenerative Agricultural Venture Program and in partnership with research um, entities to be able to scale up accessible and low cost technologies in the agriculture uh, ecosystem in order to support food security through the MENA region, looking at challenges such as high salinity and, and water scarcity. Um, we, we work really much uh, as well with some of the uh, different UN uh, bodies and we welcome all partnerships. And I really thank you very much for the opportunity to present today on these two projects that we are running and happy to connect to discuss even more. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tatiana, for your excellent work and your mobilization based on voluntary efforts. We need more champions like you. And in the UAE, we always have the question of sustaining life, and which is the title of this webinar, but also looking into the traditional systems of water management, like the Aflaj uh, system, which is now a UNESCO heritage uh, uh, registry. And therefore, it's important for us to keep looking at different innovations as we combat additional challenges facing a warming planet, climate change, and also more scale water management. Um, I would like us to, there is a couple of questions in the chat, but perhaps I would also want to pose my own question, which is related to the water energy nexus, since most water we have in the UAE is desalinized, and it's very energy intensive in that sense. There is a question in terms of how can we strengthen that link in national action plans on adaptation, on NDCs and other related matters, and what kind of recommendations that you might have on this in, in our reflection 
on the different presentations that we've had. I also noted in the chat there are a few questions asking for the presentations. The session is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube page. I put the link for our YouTube page on the chat where you can access it as well as uh, a uh, prior webinar under the series. So you can access all that materials in there. Maybe we can follow the same format of the uh, presentation and starting with our colleagues from UN Water Experts Group to, to, to reflect on this issue and in terms of uh, how that also links to the uh, uh, NDCs and, and future action on climate change. Yes, thank you very much, Ryder. Maybe I can I can kickstart uh, the discussion around the water and energy nexus, and we uh, touched upon it uh, in our uh, in our presentation, right? And uh, the critical role that water has in the renewable energy transition, and uh, for that, and it was reiterated in 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 uh, in this session uh, quite often. We have to know that okay, our energy systems depend on the water. And actually, all energy systems depend in the one or the other way on the water. And therefore, governments need to understand, OK, how much water resources uh, do I have available in my country? And uh, how will that evolve uh, throughout the future? You mentioned, OK, you can use um, saline uh, uh, water and uh, and and uh, for um, for for the energy uh, production or 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 uh, treat it desalinize uh, it, but of course this is again an energy uh, um, uh, uh, consumptive uh, process and has also some byproducts that a country has to de deal with. So uh, my advice uh, would be definitely okay. Let's uh, understand how much water resources we have, and as a matter of fact. Uh, over 60% uh, of uh, UN member states don't have adequate monitoring systems in their countries in place. So this is the first step, understand having the data and the information available to make these decisions and then make uh, uh, smart decisions on which energy sources uh, to rely on and which uh, energy sources um, to further develop uh, in, in the country. And as we heard also from the last presenter, we have to adapt to our natural circumstances. How is our ecosystems? How, how is our situation? And, uh, and develop the, the solutions uh, based on that. So I'll, I'll stop here to give uh, room to, to other colleagues to reflect on your yeah. question. Thank you very much, Raiden. Sorry to jump in, but there is also a question in the chat which I forgot about cloud seeding. It's asking, um, Status of weather modification issues with cloud seeding. Is it an accepted adaptation strategy? Is there some international regulation in place about cloud seeding? Just if you have any thoughts on that point as well. I'm not aware of any international regulation on cloud seeding. Maybe colleagues uh, know about that. You know, my uh, my background, uh, and I'm a little bit biased on that. I'm uh, I'm I'm a biologist and I studied environmental science and and come from the environmental perspective. So. For me, as uh, uh, I, I think my priority would be to adapt to our natural circumstances and try to have as uh, minimal impact on our environmental uh, cycle, on our environment uh, as as possible. But this is, of course, my my, my personal uh, opinion. Um, if I may step in a little bit uh, based on what uh, Nicola said, uh, firstly on water energy nexus, I think um, water community and energy community both understand the interlinkages, but there is a missing link that brings them together. And particularly when we are talking about NDC target, very few elements has been uh, identified, uh, which brings uh, water energy's role in NDC. So that's precisely the uh, message of our presentation from climate uh, water and climate expert group to uh, uh, make uh, aware about having um, water in the mitigation processes, uh, bringing also linking with the energy as as uh, highlighted by Nicola. So uh, it's very important to highlight the linkages between water and energy, but also to address that in NDCs. After all, we are trying to help countries to uh, really fulfill their NDCs commitment. That's one thing. Regarding um, seed, um, uh, which is uh, intervention in the natural system, so it 
can be considered as a local phenomena. I, I, I think uh, from what we have seen so far, uh, there is a cautiously welcome uh, issues to address local impact uh, when when you have a drought, when you have um, uh, when you need a, a snow for your local phenomena, the, the cloud seeding can provide you local solution, but not as such it can uh, replace uh, what we otherwise expect from uh, climate mitigation processes. So there is, I, I, I'm not aware of any global regulation on that, but of course this can provide some local solution uh, depending on the situation. Thank you. Perhaps, Sonia, you'd like to jump in as well. And I also noted the question on transboundary uh, cooperation. I think our um, colleague Sonia had to leave because she oh, was okay. committed to under the meeting. Uh, I don't know what is the question about transboundary, but yeah, she, she will follow. She's answering. she's answering in the chat, so I think she's bilaterally uh, listening in and, and answering okay. the chat, but probably Fantastic. cannot connect. Fantastic. So I, I hope this engagement was useful in terms of transboundary cooperation. Perhaps I can invite our colleagues Alice and, and, and Tatiana for any reflections as well. Thank you. No, I think uh, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. I think our colleagues are um, definitely better position to answer these uh, these uh, specific questions um, on our end um, is uh, more and better data and everything like strategies should be grounded on context specific knowledge um, and of course again from our perspective uh, thinking about criminal justice to invest in conflict sensitive management but um, again from the scientific uh, questions I think they're better suited. Thank you. This was actually the goal of this webinar series. It's intended to be educational, informative, showcasing the resources, showcasing the things that we know, and also the things that we don't know, avoiding the echo chamber effect of speaking to only our friends and those we engage with and trying to highlight some different perspectives. How does water affect social cohesion? How does it affect livelihoods? How does it link to different cultural aspects of engagements along these lines? But also looking at the linkages with the broader climate change agenda as we get towards COP28 and looking at the robust uh, areas of work that we will need to engage in. So with that, I would like to thank all the presenters and the speakers for their uh, fruitful engagements and the rich interventions. Uh, I hope this webinar was useful for your purposes and I look forward to connecting with you on our next webinars. Next week, we will be discussing the contributions of the private sector to climate action. Many comments start by saying that the private sector is the reason why we have a warming planet because of all the economic activity. So as an economist, I do not take issue with that, but I think it can also include some of the key solutions for addressing the crisis that, that, that we're in. Thank you all for being with us today and see you next week, same time, same place. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you very much, everyone.